So welcome to 2022. We've all made it so far um, on day four. Uh, this is also the fourth of our uh, series on avian archaeology. And if you expect turkeys again tonight, uh, you're in for a surprise. We're moving on to ducks today. And uh, I had the good fortune today of uh, having my a full day in, in the field out near Gila Bend and got to see water birds in, in the transition egrets and great blue herons. It was a wonderful day. Um, so tonight I'm back in Tucson um, where we have our headquarters at Archaeology Southwest, where we pursue our preservation archaeology meeting mission. And we're on the traditional lands of the Tano Atum. Uh, today on my trip, I was out on the lands of the Akimel Atum and the Pipash. So wherever you are today, um, think about the indigenous peoples whose lands you're living on, or at least uh, visiting tonight, and uh, think in gratitude of uh, that where you are today and, and that their former uh, lands. And another um, Gratitude um, expression goes to the uh, Smith Living Trust. Uh, they are uh, the reason that we can offer this um, as a no cost uh, event throughout the year. And we have tonight um, Holly Shasma, who really needs very little introduction, but um, most of you probably know her uh, quite well from reading her works. Um, she's a research associate at the Museum of New Mexico in Santa Fe. Um, her primary research interests are the art and cosmologies of the indigenous American Southwest and Mesoamerica. And her books, Indian Rock Art of the Southwest, uh, a volume editor of Kachinas in the Pueblo World, and New Perspectives on Pottery Mound. So tonight, though, she's going to be focused on ducks, power, and the San Juan basket makers. And Holly, thanks for joining us tonight. And we're all looking forward to this. And uh, we will turn the show over to you. Thank you. Well, of course, as, as you see in the title, I'm going to be talking about ducks and power and San Juan basket makers. And as I look at this picture, I started thinking about what am I going to really say about ducks before I get to the basket makers? And it occurred to me that I would just quickly review of some categories of people in the greater American pop, overall America today uh, in their relationships to ducks. The first group I thought of were the bird watchers armed with binoculars looking for ducks, making a list of how all the ducks they can see. Another group that's involved with ducks, of course, are hunters who have guns and they bring in ducks and eat ducks. And then there's another category like farmers who raise ducks, domestic ducks. But I bet the, all of these groups together are a very small portion of American population most Americans really aren't terribly involved with ducks, but they're very interesting birds. And as metaphors, because they are so at home in the sky and on land and on the water and below the water, that there, all of these traits have been observed carefully by the indigenous people in the Southwest. And they have a very different take on ducks than the groups of people I just reviewed. Going to Zuni, for example, they're involved, well, at Zuni and also some Rio Grande Pueblos, ducks and kachinas are very closely linked. And the figure on the right, on the left, is Pautiwa. He's the head of the kachinas at Zuni. And when he travels to Zuni, he comes as a duck. And the Chinas that come with him travel as ducks. And then when they go back to Zuni, they, quoting Zunis, they put on their duck shirts and fly away. 
So ducks in this case are really travelers, facilitate intercommunication between distant places. On the right, Kiaklo, is another Kachina who is blind, but he carries a duck in his hand as a guide. So these are other aspects of ducks. They can be their knowledge and ability to reach beyond where people can reach are tapped by indigenous people and used ritually. So these are different perspectives on ducks than uh, we generally are familiar with. According to Ed Ladd of Zuni, <clears throat> in his thesis on feathers and their use, he mentions that mallard feathers are often chosen for their brilliant green color, but he doesn't really explain it beyond that, except that green is related to fertility in the earth and the sky as well, because the distinction isn't necessarily made between green and blue. So their feathers are very useful in ritual contexts. So now we're going to go to the Colorado Plateau. This is a very dry area, but there are pools, ponds, small lakes, and ducks do inhabit the Colorado Plateau. And here we see the remains of water, um, a shower in the potholes and the rocks looking off toward the mesas and um, the Cedar Mesa. So this is an area where we do find a lot of birds in rock art. Before we talk about the basket makers, I want to know, remind you that there are thousands of years prior, like around 2,000 BC, 4,000 years ago or more, we have Barrier Canyon style paintings. These works were done by hunter-gatherers and they incorporate a lot of birds. So what we see here on the and the large photograph are as a figure, a ceremonial figure, holding a serpent or a snake, and birds fly in bird form flying around his headdress. A bird approaches him on the left, and then there are these circles with wings that are thought also to represent birds uh, flying toward him. So in a sense, we are looking at birds as messengers but we're not looking at a specific bird in these cases. And the figure on the right um, is holding up his hands and birds seem to be flying out away from him, again, implying that they're messengers of some kind. And have you ever, and of course, we're all familiar with the phrase, well, how did you know my secret? Well, <clears throat> a little bird told me. We have this concept in our daily lives, but we're probably not really thinking about where it might have come from and probably something in our own cultural past. <clears throat> a second figure of a barrier canyon style with a, have tiny legs and feet at the bottom of this figure and then it rises up in this thread <clears throat> to turn into a bird. Again, it's not a specific bird, but it, represents the ability, suggests the ability of persons actually becoming birds, possibly in a trance state. So moving on and up toward a closer time, a closer in time is the basket maker rock art between basket maker two and three. And those dates about 300 to 600 are general, uh, Bird, ducks seem to appear in basket maker rock art um, late in basket maker two times, and they persist in very active scenes through basket maker three. The cutoff date is suggested by the fact that these birds are associated, strongly associated with atlatls and darts, <clears throat> and we don't have any bows and arrows in these panels. So we can use the and then, of course, when atlatls and darts faded out and bows and arrows came in is also debatable. And ritually, did they show bows, atlatls and darts in art after best bows and arrows had come in because it was a ritual thing? We don't have the answers to those questions, but these dates are approximate. Ducks and basket maker rock are distributed heavily in Cedar Mason and the Grand Gulch area. 
and uh, in Canje, where that very similar suite of paintings occurs. They also occur as far east as southwestern Colorado, along the San Juan Corridor, and then west in the, some duck-headed figures in Segi Canyon. And interestingly, the same suite of figures is also depicted in the rock art in the petrified forest area in the Little Colorado River with the same symbolism. So this is basically the distribution of these things we're looking at. And I'm not talking only about ducks, but I'm talking about a complex that involves ducks on the heads of figures. It involves flute players, magical flight, and projectiles. <clears throat> so paintings of just ducks. They can be in different colors and they can have outlines. And interestingly, the heads are usually painted or frequently painted in a different color. I don't know the reason for this, but it's quite often that we see one figure here with white a white head and then another one with a red head up here. But some of the heads are gone because the paint was a fugitive paint was used for the head in these cases. These are tails. Um, so we so they've been mistaken sometimes for baskets when they occur on people's heads, but in fact we are looking at ducks. So the duck in itself means something in its own right without any other associations. But there are many other associations, and we see ducks here on the heads of a stick basket maker figure. And there's so the four ducks in all right here with a serpent in between. Um, so this is ritual, ceremonial things. Why are ducks on people's heads? This panel in Grand Gulch, we have two yellow figures with red ducks on their heads, bordered by two guys in green, with handprints surrounding them. These handprints are thought to have been petitions by probably basket makers because in the native worldview, an image on a rock isn't necessarily just the dead image on a rock, but that it, it imparts the spiritual qualities that are regarded uh, that that are intrinsic to the figures that are painted. So, the painting itself has agency, and these look like prayers and petitions around these figures. I'm showing this slide in this from a distance because I also want to point out this quail, huge quail that seems to be part of this complex. David Whitley has discussed the fact that quail in the Great Basin are re related to shamanic practices and there are such things as quail headdresses. I'll get to that in a few minutes. But there is this large quail here. They're not very common. They're not like ducks, but we do see them associated with an art art form that may have shamanic implications. Now, the word shamanism, I have to say, is shunned quite frequently by Southwestern archaeologists. They don't want to really think about people turning into ducks or accessing the spirit world uh, in, in that kind of magical way. However, people all over the world do this. Um, anyway, there's a close-up here of yellow pay figures, red ducks, and a handprint. I really like this. I discovered this late in the game when I was putting this slide to show together <clears throat> because I really am amused by the red heads on these ducks. But the bodies have sort of eroded away because the white paint doesn't stick as well. There seems to be a baby duck over here in red, and then these heads, maybe two baby ducks. But Importantly, in this particular panel, which is quite unusual, is that we have a female basket maker figure. And this figure has been, I did, Sally Cole has made quite an issue about this being a female because she's illustrated it with a figurine of a basket maker to figurine who's wearing this diaper like pad, a menstrual pad or whatever it is, signifying fertility, with a belt. So these are. And this particular female figure, who is also wearing a necklace, does have a duck on its head. 
So they're not all male figures. Usually when sex is indicated in these panels, it's on guys. But this is a female figure with a duck head. So it must have been a very powerful person that was being illustrated here or concept of a supernatural. We don't really know which. Crescent headdresses are often found on basket maker tube paintings and petroglyphs. They stack up headdresses indicating some kind of supernatural status and here associated with a duck in between a line of ceremonial paraphernalia, possibly feathers, corn. We're not really sure what's being illustrated and another, another duck from uh, Grand Gulch. This wooden, seemingly a wooden headdress was one of the artifacts, I guess it was recovered by McCoyd and Graham in Grand Gulch or that Cedar Mesa area with a bird inscribed on it is often shown as to compare with the headdresses and possibly it was part of a headdress. It's the only piece like this that's ever been found, um, but I'm just putting it on here that ducks and head, if it is a headdress, that it's another example of a bird on a head. Now these bird-headed figures, we don't know if they're people with ducks on their heads or if they're people turning into birds themselves. Three-digit hands and feet that indicate birds are quite common on the Colorado Plateau, whether it was an economy, the strategy of the economy of depiction, or whether they're indicating a transform, transformation here, we just it's, we just have to consider the possibility that that's what be, is being shown. We don't know for sure. But supernatural flight is certainly indicated by, by paintings like this, where we have this red figure, legs curled up, and a big duck seems to be carrying it away. Now, supernatural flight is something that does go with shamanic practices of people accessing another realm through flight. And the whole point of doing this is to gain more knowledge, to cope with the problems of, of life. And these people who enter a trance state, say, which is a symbolic death, trance, moving to another realm, can come back with knowledge from that spiritual realm with which to help their people handle the problems of, of hunting magic, um, warfare, um, success in bringing rain and so on and so forth. But they're trying to obtain more power. And we see other indications of flight here in this figure that is not standing firmly on the ground at all, but is floating with a duck on his head flute player in between, and whoever this is, I'm not really sure, but we've got the flute player playing music associated with duck-headed peoples. So this is part of the complex that we find repeatedly on the cliffs of the Colorado Plateau. In this petroglyph, we've got these duck-headed figures and several, we have flute player here, here, and then one that's cut off here, you see the hands and flute. And they seem to be playing to the, the sun, but again, whether this is, I'm not sure what is meant there, but we do have duck-headed figures and ducks and other duck-head here. Um, so this is an association that, again, it's a repeated thing. And like Solvig Chirpin has observed that <clears throat> ritual art is, is redundant art. In other words, when you get these redundancies, you realize that they're part of a structure of thinking, a paradigm. Another place we find duck-headed figures represented is in ceremonial scenes. And here we have a group of people who emerge from a crack over this way and are walking toward some circles which indicate ceremonial rooms or something on to the right or the left. Um, in this procession, and these are very crudely pecked out figures, we do have a duck-headed figure, 
another figure over here holding a crook. This is another ceremonial staff. And here is the detail of the duck-headed person. There may be more, in, or were more in the mind of the person who pecked this, but they only took the care to indicate clearly one duck-headed figure. So they're part of the ceremonial complex. And this amazing panel, known as Wolfman, because of the flanking wolf tracks, and this is in the way, but I don't know what to do with it. Anyway, there's a wolf track over there. Um, is, this is, was done by some expert Petri bookmaker who really had his art under control, who must have taken a long time. These figures are huge, beautifully pecked out, and centered on a, I'm going to call him a shaman or a ritual part practitioner with a feather on his head that looks very much like a quail feather and reading Whitley's descriptions from of some of the figures in the Great, Great Basin. I've just thought that possibly that is one. And we see the same feather on this <clears throat> trophy head to the right, his left, and <clears throat> on this ceremonial staff as well. So beyond the head, we have a basket maker bag, which would be a medicine mm -hmm. bag, and two enormous lobe circles of questionable identity. Sometimes they're shown as heads of basket maker figures, but we're not really sure of all of their meaning. But importantly for this discussion, where this basket maker figure here is there's a duck standing by him and then a crane both water birds, and they're all connected with him, so indicating that he has power from them. And again, a ceremonial staff and a dart over here. And then the <clears throat> hidden medicine bag, and the wolf, additional wolf trap. So this is the only rock art panel I know where you've got a, a seemingly conscious display of the powers adjunct powers that a shaman or a medic, ritual pra practitioner would have had access to to boost his ability to uh, control the world or what for, was needed. One of the other elements I haven't really discussed much yet, but are really important in these ducks associated panels are atlals and darts. So what are they doing here? Here are two big uh, darts or spears. And over here, it, there is a figure with a bird on his head. And he, the figure oh, to his right is holding a projectile. And he's running or moving somehow toward this figure with a bird that looks more like a turkey, but probably really was still a duck. Um, so there's some kind of confrontation um, what are what are we the spirit world if the duck is carrying these figures to the spirit world what role do spears and atlatls have in these scenes nevertheless they do have a role and here we have <clears throat> another shaman figure I'll call him that um, with a duck on his head and ceremonial staffs and a typical staff that goes often paired with an atlatl of uh, spear thrower. And so he's armed to the teeth. The same complex, that last mm -hmm. figure was in Canyon de Chez. I mean, it was in Brand Gulch, but moving down to Canyon de Chez here, we find a whole series of darts and projectiles, a duck painted on top of an earlier basket maker figure, oh. and more ducks and more projectiles over here. So. We've, it's the same complex. In this group of petroglyphs, we small, find smaller ducks, but enormous darts um, or spears. So, and they're because they're so large, that is an, means that they are extremely important. We also find petroglyphs of really focused on. Mm -hmm. The atlatl, a small spear thrower, with the larger darts to be thrown next to it. This is a set of weapons. They're paired over here. 
Um, all of this pairing probably has some meaning to it, and I haven't really addressed it. But anyway, there's two sets. These would not be illustrated if they didn't have symbolic meaning. People don't just draw pictures of their equipment on the cliff if there's not a metaphorical or symbolic meaning inherent in them. And so we begin to ask what could be the significance of, of a projectile. Well, we do know that arrows are regarded, our fletched arrows are known as messengers to the other world in many contexts. Historically, and even probably prehistorically, I found one site in the Rio Grande Valley where arrows were brought, pressed into a crack in the rock as petitions to the other world for as a prayer petition or whatever. I'm suggesting that these atlatls and darts have some magical implication of travel. Again, you know, getting access to the world of spirits. And again, here we have a pair of buckheads <clears throat> and an enormous uh, dart. They're probably holding atlatls in their hand. They're really not very clear, but they're holding something, probably the spear thrower. An amazing scene here on Cedar Mesa. We've got this this guy. He's really small, but he's a duckhead, and he's throwing his spear at the, the nose of a mountain lion. And above him is an enormous medicine bag, indicating that he has a lot of power and a lot of resources to be in, involved in this dangerous endeavor of spearing a mountain lion. Another duck head behind him. Over here is another a speared mountain sheep uh, with four darts in, in his body. And up here a spiral that wiggles up and ends in a, either an atlatl or a dart attached to it. So there's a lot of weaponry record here, a lot of, and, oh yes, two, and I won't forget the flute player. So what is this flute player music? Um, doing with all of these figures that are involved in in a little hunt, but it doesn't seem like a really ordinary hunt. And possibly I will suggest the duck headed figure was was spirit this may be a scene from the other world, a alternative world where he was sparing the mountain lion to get the mountain lion spirit of uh, spirit and access to it. And according to Whitley, Trance, well, not just Whitley, but many, many people who have just discussed shamanic practices. A shamanic trance induced by various means, fasting, hallucinogens, whatever, is symbolically a symbolic death that will propel you into the other world where all of these things can happen. And this seems to me like a scene from the other world. It may even depict an experience that somebody had uh, in a trance. But we've involved ducks, mountain lions, sheep in this case. And another hunt scene from Canyon de Chez where we have this mountain sheep stuck in the butt with a dart. Right in front of him is a duck headed figure and another pierced animal here. And lo and behold, a set of quail, at least four, there may be six, I'm not sure. So what are these quail doing? Again, we're not sure, but they seem somehow associated with this shamanic complex along with, with the ducks. There's also interesting in this panel are figures that look like this, with their arms up as if they were flying, but without ducks on their heads. Why don't they have ducks on their heads? We don't know. But again, there's there's a couple more figures that look like they're moving upward, somehow flying, uh, without, maybe they're not initiated. Maybe there's some status involved when you finally get to have the duck on your head. Another thing that happens in these, these paintings or petroglyphs is we find people confronting each other with with weapons. In this case, this guy's got a duck on his head, 
he's holding there's an atlatl here and the spear and there's another figure here that doesn't show up in the slide uh but there's two people fighting and this is a very active scene so is this competition between shamans here we find two clear duck-headed figures sticking each other with darts <clears throat> Um, so is this a power struggle between two? We don't know. And what's really fun up here is that these guys, the duck had ducks on their heads and the ducks are quacking, making a lot of noise, cheering them on. We don't know. But it does leave a lot of questions. And uh, this figure here seems to have clearly duck bird feet, but with no duck. So we don't understand this like a whole story, but we can say that we, there are a lot of mysterious things here that are indicated that we really don't have the answers for. Nevertheless, it's out here on the rocks. And I mentioned earlier that this complex extends south <clears throat> and west into the little Colorado River drainage around petrified forests. And this is an assemblage of figures uh, put together by um, Pat McCreary and, and Malachi on the similar figures there. There are a few interesting differences. This group up here with ducks on their head have wings, possibly, indicating they're part bird. Or it could also represent rain, that they're rain bringers. Or the wing and the rain could be exactly the same thing. It doesn't matter which interpretation you give it, because there are a lot of mm -hmm. things in rock art that are symbolically <clears throat> the same thing. So, and, and the ambiguity actually adds to the power of the image. So we have the duck-headed figures holding crooks and with a dart here, a flute player here with a duck on his head, another duck head holding darts. And in these two cases, they seem to have animals that have been captured or pelts. Can't be, really be sure what they are. We haven't seen those before. But again, we still have the same complex flute players, duck heads, and projectile points, um, meaning that we do have a very integrated um, conceptual worldview that was spread throughout the Four Corners area. What we see in this is a belief in the con understanding, I should say, really, of the interconnectivity of all beings that is back a fundamental perspective that underlies all of this rock art and a kinship with with all life so that pretty pretty much sums it up sky earth the surface of the water and going underneath the water. They can access all, all realms. Therefore, they're important birds to connect with. They might help you out. Thanks to John Pitts and Kurt Schaffson for use of their photographs. And thank you, uh, Archaeology Southwest, for inviting me, for Archaeology Cafe, to inviting me to, uh, the, to do this presentation. Thank you. All right. Oh, thank you so much. I, I certainly didn't realize there was such a coherent sort of complex, like you say, of these things. It's really clear there's. Yes, there's, they go together. Right? They go together. Yeah. Over and over again. Yeah. There were so many ducks on people's heads. Okay. <laughs> um, so we're going to take some questions. I'm going to try to throw some questions and um, I'll try to wander through the questions that people have been asking. We had like 300 people listening to this tonight, Polly, just FYI. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> and there's some people, you know, I'm going to try to, I'm trying to see what people have been asking. And um, yeah, um, so you, one person asking that, you know, thanking so much for pointing out that the ducks span the four elements, that that's really a key, a key point in the interpretation that that's, um, that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, somebody was asking um, that many of the ducks could be male mallards. Do you have any sense of what kind of duck they really are? Well, they might be. I mean, there was a lot of them shown with a line around the neck, which a mallard has. Mm -hmm. 
there are other ducks that have that too, but they might not, I mean, we don't know, of course, because they don't, they aren't painting them realistically, but they could be, they could be. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I don't know how we would ever figure that out. Yeah. But uh, anyways, it's a possibility. And the mallards might be valued more because of their brilliant, brilliant green color. Mm -hmm. like differentiation there. But they're certainly, they're not pintails, even though that bird I was showing, duck was, was a pintail, because they've got little stubby tails for the most part, the ones in the rock art. Um, ha have, you, you know, have you interacted with or talked with any um, indigenous um, peoples, native, native folk that you know, ask their oh. viewpoints about the ducks? And the most information we really have is from Zuni, where mm -hmm. they talk about ducks explicitly, and there's some Rio Grande Pueblos as well. Um, but I, I haven't personally discussed these birds with any, with anyone. Um, I but also would like to point out that when I talk about all that information about ducks from Zuni, I am not implying that there's a direct line between these basket maker ducks and Zuni. In other words, or any linguistic group, because it's too diffuse, and we're looking at 1,500 years apart. And all of those projectiles and so forth that we're looking at in the rock art are not part of the Zuni complex. I mean, it's, it, but yet there's a the continuity of relating to other life forms. And the duck's qualities, of course, haven't changed from basket maker times to now. And if people perceive their, their ability to fly and, uh, and be at home and go disappear under the water. Now, mallards don't disappear, but there are a lot of species that feed underwater and they just vanish. Mm -hmm. so you're, you're watching them and then they come up somewhere quite far from where they went down. <laughs> so they're, they're pretty mysterious that way. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking about uh, Zuni, um, our buddy Ben Bellarado asks he says he says i he says i think you've suggested that there aren't any duck heads in the zuni area do you think that's still the case no well if there's water there's ducks i don't know i'm not familiar with the ponds okay no i i think he means duck heads in the oh in the rock in the rock, rock, in the rock, rock art around I'm not zuni. familiar with any duck no no huh. basket maker to san san juan focus really on the san juan I don't know of any down there. I mean, one might turn up somewhere because some of the rock art, well, some of it in Zuni Wash ties into the little Colorado River a little bit. There might be something, but not not like not like this, not like the San Juan at all. Mm -hmm. I had a couple questions. People are were asking, you know, do the duck do duck figures show up at all in Later, Pueblo 1-3 art, or do they show up, there was another one, in Fremont, Rocker. I don't know of any in Fremont, which is interesting because at Fremont, there's such continuity between, certain continuities between basket maker rock art and Fremont on other subjects, yeah. but not in ducks that I can think of. I was thinking huh. about the same thing today. Huh. Um, there are birds depicted here in the Rio Grande Valley that look kind of like ducks. I'm not sure, but there's no duck heads, no. <laughs> that, that is very much limited to basket maker too in, in the San Juan area and little Colorado, as we saw. But that, that, that seems to be a very definite cutoff point. Huh, that's interesting, yeah. Let's see. Oh, someone's mentioning there's not many ducks in the Hornada Maguillon area. I just thought I'd share that just for the fun of it. Um, oh, here's a good point. Here's a good question. So we got lots of basket maker figures with ducks on their heads, okay? Are there fig basket maker figures with other animals on their heads or is it ducks that's around? That it's, is it specific to I, ducks? I, I haven't really definitely pinned down any other animal on the head. Um, Campbell Grant called some of those ducks turkeys, but looking at them more closely, I really don't think they are. I I subscribed to that for a while, but putting this together, I decided they really probably aren't. Mm. 
mostly ducks. There are a lot of turkeys illustrated over here later on in the rock art in Rio Grande Valley, um, but not on heads. I mean, the duck head figure, there's one figure, oh, but it's only one, and it's not clear. Oh, it, a site called Monkey Steps on the San Juan that might be an animal, but I don't think it is. I mean, mm -hmm. it's sort of ambiguous. So uh, it's not a normal kind of thing where they were synthesized, you know, human synthesis with any old animal. Or There's bird. something it's, specific about the ducks. It's definitely. about the ducks. Yeah. That's a good question, though. Well, and here's another one that I think is interesting that do these images, you know, what about the context of these images? Do the images of the ducks and the duck figures seem to have a, like any specific association in the landscape? Is there? Um, I don't know. I mean, I've never looked at, you'd have to go back to all those sites and try to figure that out. And do they occur near ponds? I mean, right. Can, Canyon de Chez, and and Grand Gulch. I mean, there are places in all of those canyons where water collects during rainstorms or floods or whatever. I don't know if the duck paintings or petroglyphs are associated with those spots. I, I don't, that has not been addressed really. Mm -hmm. But there are plenty of places, like Segi Canyon has got lots of little lakes and ponds and things. Um, mm -hmm. There's only one site that I recall there, it was actually at Keith Seal, where we get duck headed figures in Segi. There may, may be some ducks across the canyon from there on the rocks, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. but, can, but in Keith Seal, which those paintings that have been made prior to Keith Seal, they're basket maker figures. Keith Seal being 1200 to 1300, 1280 site, I mean, the, the cliff dwelling. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Huh. Okay. So I'd comment here. We should. We need to get an orth orth you know a bird person to talk to us about what birds do and tell us more. But anyway, um, question about um, is there any pop? Is there any significance of? In, well, you. I think you touched on this briefly. But maybe you could talk about it a little bit more about the, the relative size of the duck shapes versus the human shapes. I think you touched on a little bit about well, size meaning. Well, usually size means more important. I mean, it's not usually in perspective. It's not, it, it emphasizes the importance of something that like we looked at one panel with a medicine bag, which is giant and sort of swamped the figure in front of it. It was piercing the mountain lion, but that must've been a reference to his powers really. Um, and a big duck on a little figure, I'm sure that that, if you ask the person who painted that or picked that out, there would have been an answer. I don't have it. So all you can really say is, if it's bigger, it's more important. And, and the size, too, of some of those darts uh, under the, uh, that were on that panel, petroglyph panel, below rather small duck figures. But that, again, you do have the association there. Hmm. Oh, somebody's asked about, there are, I'm not sure what the timing is it, duck-shaped pitcher pots? Do you know anything about duck those? Pot, oh, duck-shaped pots in the oh, archaeological record that we get. They've been- Those wouldn't duck. be basket maker though, right? Well, they're Pueblo one. Okay. I think, I think they're a little later. Right. Um, and they, people have discussed them as ways of baking food or used for cooking and that these duck shaped pots. Um, I really haven't examined that. And I think that would be an interesting thing to pursue a little bit. But I don't, because we're dealing with Basket Maker 2, um, it, it, it probably it doesn't, isn't relevant because there wasn't really much pottery at that point. Right, right. And Couple so, people. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, well, I was just going to say, in all of these rituals, ritual narrative scenes seem to be really prolific during during Basket Maker three times, where they get lots of active figures. And uh, then the the issue that somebody could really point out is 
since they're ritual scenes, and I mentioned this earlier, they could have persisted in depicting atlatls and darts when they by the even when they had the bow and arrow, if the bow but the bow and arrow itself as an icon is never represented as an icon of its own. So they didn't attribute the same meaning to it. So the cutoff dates, you can't be really sure. However, it's not late. It's not P3, P2 or P3. Yeah. yeah. Do you do you know of any do you know of anything about if ducks are being used in any other way during this time? Is there any evidence uh, of like duck bones, duck feathers, consuming okay. ducks? Kate Bishop mentioned to me that you don't find many duck bones. They're not eating ducks. And you don't find any hunted ducks. You don't find ducks with spears, which is an interesting oh. thing because oh. uh, Whitley was talking about spearing sheep in the Koso range, speared sheep releasing the spirit of the bighorn sheep to bestow power on the rain shaman. <clears throat> so the connection between the shaman figure and the projectile and the dead sheep was conveying power back to the shaman who shot the projectile. Hmm. Um, we don't find that, we don't find any ducks with arrows. I mean, the, the projectiles are in, either in in the basket maker rock out there in the sheep, one case, or no, there's a couple of cases, and uh, or in um, in each other, of, in people. There's one, and there's one petroglyph, I didn't show it, of a duck headed figure along with San Juan with a guy, very small, he's got a handful of darts. Hmm. And, and a, there's a whole lot of darts leaving him, like he's shooting off a lot of them all at once. And I didn't have enough of a slide to see what the target might have been. <laughs> so, so since I haven't been there for a while, I don't remember. <laughs> no, it's interesting stuff. Speaking of the scenes with the darts and adults and, and adolatles and stuff, um, someone was asking about the spirals. Do you have a sense of what their place is in the scene, what they're doing there? No, I don't. There no. aren't there aren't many, and they don't. And there's only that one that sort of spirals up and ends in, in a projectile or right. or an atlet. I can't yeah. tell which really in that case. Um, but so I don't really know. Mm -hmm. That could be looked at. You know, I could go. You could go back through all those panels and look at and see. But spirals are such an ambiguous image. They can mean many things. And what what they meant then, I don't know. Or they can mean many things at once. Um, so it's I don't know. <laughs> That's the sort of the challenge about when you're dealing with iconography on rocks and things. And yeah, we're yeah yeah. <laughs> So that you have to admit there's a great deal of things we don't know. One of the things that we does come out of this is that what is pictured on those rocks in the San Juan drainage is much more complicated than the duck symbolism that the Zunis are talking about with the Kachina flight. I mean, that's simple, seems to be simple flight back and forth, makes sense. Uh, and it's, ducks are associated with water. The, Kachinas are the ancestors, Zuni dead ancestors live under the lake. I mean, the, the tide of the water, the lake, the duck and the travel all makes a really good package. But what we're looking at in the petroglyphs and the paintings uh, has, has another complication there with the flute players and the projectiles. Adds a much more complicated layer to the whole process. Right. Right, yeah, yeah. One person was wondering, um, can you can you speak to the quail anymore? Can you tell us any more about what the quail you think are doing I, in there? I don't know. I, mean, I tried to find out. The quail are really interesting. I read something somewhere and could not find it. I'm putting this together where they quail have a role in in combat and warfare 
because they come in and they flutter and they mess up footprints. So they can disguise mm. disguise where people have been, at least symbolically, they hold that power. And therefore they have a certain power. There's a quail. I came at that from looking at warfare iconography and people around here in the Galisteo Basin. And there's a quail and I was trying to figure it out, but I couldn't find the reference for that. I was looking for it. But, you know, they, they so many other things. Ed Ladd said that they don't use quail feathers very much in prayer sticks because quail are so secretive that they wouldn't, the quail feather wouldn't have the strength to send a message to the spirit world. Huh. Hmm. So it's not a powerful feather to be used because hmm. it's secretive. So hmm. you have to, you get this picture of, of I mean, looking really carefully at the habits and the behavior of all of these animals and birds, and then selecting the ones, the powers that they have that you need. And Zuni, again, and I come back to Zuni because Zuni has talked about this. In the hierarchy of being, man is on the bottom, and he needs to tap into the powers of the rest of all life in order to survive. Mm. Survive and have the rain come. Of the sun, enough heat for the corn to grow, enough sun, rain to come kind of water the crops, and on and on and on. And so the powers of all other forms of life are recognized and they're to be utilized. And man is just one piece of the circle, not in the center, dominating. In other words, we're, and frankly, we have less powers and we have to be connected. And so in all of the Pueblo, worldview you get this interaction with all of life in order for to survive and religion is tied into the world around everybody and and tangible a tangible world really uh, that does affect us so it's the environment yeah no no you're very right there yeah one of our viewers, um, I'm going to probably wrap this up here pretty soon but one of our viewers was asking is there are you have any plans for publication around this um, well, complex and there, telling the, evil, the issue of Kiva that they're planning um, that probably will be out I don't know another year I'm not, I'm not, it won't be out in 2022 I don't think okay. I think in 2023 I get I'm making a guess I'm speaking for Kiva I have no <laughs> I don't have any right to do that but I would assume <laughs> it would be something like that but there will be an issue on birds yeah and I, I, I'll add too to, for the gang that, um, well, the, 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 um, the impetus for this whole Archaeology Cafe series this year was the Archaeology Southwest magazine that's going to be coming out sometime in the spring, I think. Hopefully Kate, who's listening, won't be screaming at me about that, um, that yeah. it's all on birds. So, so um, we'll be having a bird issue where Polly's um, addressing some of this a little bit as well. Just a little bit, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's been a lot of comments, Polly, and as you can imagine, you know, lots of ideas. You've really, you've clearly stimulated everybody's thinking. There's lots of people thinking about, well, what could this mean? This might mean this. Have we thought about, you know, this is how ducks behave. So it's, it's clear people have really um, been, you know, caught by your presentation and you've got them thinking about um, what this could all, what this all could actually mean. But I think that we will, um, probably ask Dr. Doley to come back and potentially wrap us up for the evening. If Bill will join us. Thank uh, you, Bill. Here. Uh, I'm going to try to share my screen again and put something up while you wrap us up, Bill. Okay. Well, again, this, thank you, Polly, uh, very much. And I think what's fun about this and truly educational about this um, avian archaeology series is that we look at so many different aspects that focus on the images today in, in the rock um, petroglyphs and, and paintings. Um, we've been talking about DNA and making feather <laughs> blankets and, and um, other topics here. This avian archaeology is, um, and I'm glad you started, um, Holly, with the ways in which people, you know, think about ducks, and and uh, it it's 
enriches our way of, of thinking about um, what people were doing in the past and how it might ultimately connect to the present. So thank you very much. And we're gonna continue this on February 1st, um, the first Tuesday in February with Caitlin Bishop, uh, University of Illinois at uh, Urbana-Champaign, uh, focusing on the importance of birds in Chaco Canyon. So uh, some of the insights and findings of, again, going to the archeological record, avifaunal remains from Chaco Canyon, New Mexico. So um, let's uh, have a good month here, uh, this first month of 2022, and we look forward to seeing you in uh, February, on the first day of February. Again, thank you, Polly, and thanks all of our attendees tonight. See you soon. <laughs>